you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian by New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mario Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. Before we start, we'd like to have a toast and drink a lot of wine while we um, doing this program for Cheers. you. Cheers. Um, because it's Ramadan and we are promoting eating uh, during Ramadan in order to show our solidarity with all of those people who are arrested, fined and harassed and intimidated for eating uh, during this horrendous month. Defines, that's what it is. Um, this week's programme, we have an interview with uh, singer-songwriter Shelley Segal. We'll also be talking about Ramadan, some news around it. Our insane fatwa from ISIS is about Ramadan as well. You don't want to miss this. And of course, our slice of life is a special on Ramadan too. Um, so uh, we've got lots of uh, interesting topics to discuss on this issue. We'll also be talking about an Iranian footballer who's been banned for six months for wearing yellow trousers. Spongebob. Yeah. Spongebob. And also a further arrests in Iran, including of dual nationals. And of course, uh, the fourth anniversary of Raif Badawi in prison is also coming up. So we'd like to... Uh, speak about that as well. Don't go away. You don't want to miss this program. This is the bleak month of Ramadan and it's pretty sickening when you hear everybody talking about happy Ramadan this, happy Ramadan that and not taking into account, first of all, it's absurd that people have to fast for an up to 19 hours a day from dawn to dusk, not even having water, not even having chewing gum. Not even being able to brush their teeth. It's not even having wine. I mean, that's how <laughs> not can even you, having wine. I how mean, can you? How can you do that's that? That's even more outrageous than <laughs> food and water, isn't it? Absolutely. I think um, you know it's a form of control. No matter how you try to justify it. I mean, in Iran, they're trying to justify um, you know Ramadan. Saying, oh, actually, it has health benefit. If you don't don't <laughs> eat for nineteen hours, yeah, it's which like is Islamic not true. health benefits. Everything's opposite. You know? and, and it's a time for the Islamists, and it's it, you know they suddenly they become normalized. Uh, it's Facebook. It's changes the ribbon at the top, uh, the banner to uh, uh, putting veil on um, on young children. And that's what the, the ribbon goodness, it goodness. has. The, uh, the there's a woman who's uh, uh, covered in hijab and there's a little child as well in hijab as well. Oh I think gosh. Facebook is disgusting. Outrageous. And the point is that look, you know, someone wrote to us saying, uh, "Why are you defying fasting rules? Please don't insult people. Leave leave Muslims alone. Don't antagonize them." The point is not about antagonizing anyone. The point is that there are lots of people, including Muslims, who do not want to fast. So when you have the situation where Ramadan is supreme and it's seen to be something that everybody needs to pay respects to, it puts a lot of pressure on people who don't want to fast. There's a perfect example of a French waitress in. She's a Muslim waitress, uh, originally Tunisian, who was serving wine at a restaurant and these two Islamist guys came up to her, slapped her, uh, called her a whore for serving wine and she was saying that, look, uh, I've served alcohol in Tunisia and I've never had this yes. response. This sort of celebration and, you know, Ramadan in our faces day in and day out is part of this normalization of something which is really, really unhealthy, oppressive. And why does it have to be a public thing? If you're fasting, good for you. Keep it to yourself. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Actually, it's compulsory. It's one of the five yeah. pillars of uh, right. um, um, Islam and Islamism. Um, in Iran, for example, at the beginning, the uh, the security, um, the head of security uh, forces and the police in every town, they go and start sort of issuing a declaration that any form of trans transgression of the, the rules and regulation will be severely punished mm -hmm. and he, people get imprisoned. So it's important to defy. It, it's a resistance, actually. It's, yeah. it's part of the, the resistance in Middle East and North Africa. And some people are trying to normalize it um, in, in Europe and in America, and that needs to be exposed. Yeah, and I mean, the reality of the matter is that this is something that people are fighting against all the time. You have young people, um, going and uh, having picnics, for example, in a place like Morocco. You have lots of people having um, um, eating, um, in a, even in places like Iran, where they're arrested and flogged. And of course, um, even in uh, Nadia Alfani's film, uh, Neither Allah nor Master, she films, uh, you know, 
she films uh, herself going into a cafe where people are eating and people get upset with her saying don't show this on film because we're not supposed to be eating and that's even in a place like Tunisia so all that pressure is there it is important to and it's huge make amount, a stance and it's huge amount of resistance as what we're trying to do is to actually show the resistance yeah. against this barbaric compulsory rule yeah now um, uh, one of the other issues that I think we wanted to talk about was of course um, following on the issue of Iran and the fact that there's a uh, Iranian footballer who has been banned from playing for six, six months. months because of his trousers. Yeah, so Shama Khani, who is a, a, um, a goalkeeper for Persepolis Club, um, he's, he's wearing a, a, a funny... <laughs> Uh, yellow trousers, a SpongeBob trousers, and it's been banned by well, the I mean, by the Charles, ethics committee yes, of Football yeah. Federation. <laughs> I mean, granted, talk about ethics. Gr granted, you know, it's so hideous his trousers. <laughs> but if there were to be bans on clothing, that should be a legitimate ban. But I'm joking. Yeah, of course you are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, but, uh, the point is that no matter what people wear, they should be. <laughs> <laughs> I was just shocked as well. <laughs> I was just you joking because it was so bad as trousers. Yes, yeah. But he's also, I mean, he's constantly harassed, isn't he? He was even temporarily jailed for a little while for uh, sh having pictures on social media of himself with unveiled women, for example. Yeah. It's just to show how much of, uh, you know, uh, they're constantly intervening in every aspect of people's lives, uh, including when you wear yellow trousers. I Absolutely. mean, there's no end in sight. Yes. Yes, we should all go and get some of those trousers. They are well, actually, his shoes the top are very really nice. <laughs> Everybody wanted to know where he's got his shoes from. <laughs> very colorful, very nice. Well done, so sure. <laughs> uh, now, um, one of the things that have been in the news recently are the arrests of dual Iranian nationals. Uh, of course, we know uh, just just a few days ago, Homa Hutfar, who is an academic, who's a well-known uh, women's rights campaigner, she went back to Iran and she's been arrested. Um, and again, we know uh, we've talked about other cases such as Nazanin uh, Zakari Radcliffe, who also went back uh, in April to visit her family. She was been in solitary confinement for a long time. Her two-year-old child, who just became two a few days ago, uh, was separated from her. Uh, her passport was taken away. Um, and, uh, you know, I was reading about how when she came out of solitary confinement, she couldn't walk anymore because she was in there for so long. And she, and she couldn't actually she uh, couldn't hold, hold her, her baby. child. And yeah. I mean, that, that's really painful. And it's part and parcel of the Islamic regime's attempt to prevent any link yeah. Uh, with sort of people who uh, uh, resist mm -hmm. uh, and any reflection of the reality. But al Iran. also it's to create fear, isn't Absolutely, it? Because, yeah. I mean, Nazari Ra uh, Radcliffe hasn't really, isn't involved in politics, neither is Homa Hotfar. You can imagine what they would do if we ever went back. <laughs> cheers. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> Let's drink to that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, the fact of the matter is, it is a question of just intimidating the population because no one ever knows why anyone is being flogged, why anyone's being arrested, why they choose chose this person versus that person. At the same time it's very futile. It is a futile exercise by the Islamic yeah. because the resistance is so huge. Yeah. You know, imagine for example Bell, they've tried to impose well for 37, 38 years to no avail. Yeah. Well, uh, what uh, I was just reading about um, the uh, daughter, her daughter, Nazanin's daughter, uh, Gabriella, who was uh, who's staying with uh, Nazanin's parents while she's in prison. Uh, she became two recently, and her father uh, uh, and some of her family members had a birthday party for her in a park. They had a teddy bear picnic, and over Skype, they sang happy birthday for her. And it's really, really heartbreaking when you think about, you know, what's happened to this family. But also don't forget that dual nationals are what we often hear about in the press. But every day the Iranian regime is doing this to countless families, uh, flogging workers for uh, demanding better wages, you know, and on and on and on. And then it, it, it's a reflection of the brutality of this regime. And, and, the, and suddenly they say the month of Ramadan is ma month of... And suddenly we shouldn't be insulting yeah, them on the month anybody, of Ramadan. here we go. Enjoy yeah. your Ramadan in drink and, and defy. But before we go, I do want to just uh, talk about um, two quick things. One is that we're having an eat-in in front of various embassies, Iranian embassy, Saudi embassy and some others. 24th on of the June? 24th of June, exactly. Yeah. So do uh, come, if you're in London and you want to join us, 
do come. Otherwise, you could take photos of yourself eating or drinking during the hours where you're not allowed to and post them on social media. Organize, uh, uh, you know, Ramadan defying eating parties. <laughs> yeah, That's definitely. Want, yes. And finally, uh, the 17th of June is also the fourth anniversary of Raif Badawi in prison. Uh, 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 several organizations and activists are trying to gather a thousand images of people um, on social media showing solidarity with him and his family uh, for the 17th of June. So please do join in uh, with that if you can. A thousand photos for the thousand lashes that he has been sentenced to. We need to keep the pressure on for all of these wonderful, wonderful people. Last week when I spoke at the Reason Rally in Washington DC, a brilliant, brilliant, huge rally of free thinkers and secularists and atheists in defense of reason, it was wonderful. I met up with Shelley Seagal, who is a wonderful singer. If I was religious, I would say she has the voice of an angel. And so I, I was really glad to meet up with her and interview her. I'm not religious, but I think she does have a voice. <laughs> And what was interesting is um, she, her father was with her and he played on the violin while she sang and it was just a wonderful thing to see. Stay with us and watch this interview. Thank you Shelley for doing the interview. I wanted to ask you about your music. Uh, wh what are the main messages in your music? Well, uh, for me, my music is about uh, expressing the way that I see the world and a lot of the time I'm taking from my experiences or the experiences of people around me and kind of you know taking all these little moments and and uh, and these thoughts that I'm having and these realizations and putting them together to kind of paint an overarching picture and so the message that I try and put out uh, is one of expression of myself which is to say that my life is meaningful and that uh, there's wisdom from my everyday experiences that I can glean and, and uh, build on and I can share them and that there's, they're worthwhile. And then I also hope that uh, also as well as expression, there's a connection. And so I'm hoping to connect to people and tell them as well that there is a wisdom to glean from their lives and their experiences and that what they have to say is worthwhile as well. You've become, I think, one of the most well-known atheists, <laughs> haven't you? Yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, my first album was called An Atheist Album, and I wrote that after I became an atheist. It was a, a long process, but then I started to write about it, and it was one of the most significant experiences in my life because it changed my worldview so fundamentally in a way that nothing ever had before, and it was so exciting, and it was so new, and I was having all these discussions with people, and I was so inspired to be curious again and to learn and, and, and reanalyze everything. And so as a writer, someone that draws, as I said, from my own experience, that was a well of inspiration to dwell from to draw from and so uh, that album talks about a lot of my um, thoughts on atheism and free thinking and so that really resonated with the secular movement uh, particularly in America but around the world and you also speak a lot about women don't you yes uh, I do I think the after I had some distance and time from my religion and uh, I questioned my religion which was you know my foundational idea of how the world had come to be, the next thing that I started questioning was gender. And uh, in, in my tradition in, in Judaism, particularly in the Orthodox synagogue that I attended, uh, it's a bit of a caricature for women and men. They have their roles, they have their duties, they have, they're defined. And so uh, those, ex that exists in mainstream society in Australia as well, where I grew up, but it's, it's so much more intensified in a, in a religious community and so yeah that was the next thing that I questioned and I'm, I'm very interested in how uh, especially women who have traditionally been treated as second-class citizens how that identity shapes us shapes the way that we behave lim limits our uh, our potential in this life I mean, what was the reaction to your coming out and being an atheist because you sang right now with your father yes yeah. 
still orthodox? Well, I, I, so we're, we're more traditional. So we live probably a, a liberal or moderate level of observance. You know, we went to synagogue every week and we would keep the dietary laws and the, um, you know, holiday traditions. But, but the synagogue that we went to was orthodox. And my father is the president of the synagogues. He uh, helps run the board and everything. So it was really difficult uh, when I first came out as an atheist. I think I, I was 19, so I was um, li less articulate than I like to think I am now. <laughs> and also I was very angry. I was very, very angry. I felt like I'd wasted my life and I'd lost the uh, opportunity for a better education and you know the hours and hours of prayers that I could recite and the energy and effort and love that I put into that worldview felt wasted and, and I was very angry. I felt like saying to my parents, how could you teach me all these things without finding out if they were true first? But of course, you know, they, they were duped the same way that I was, that was, you know, that's just their upbringing. And, uh, and as I became less angry and more articulate, I was able to really communicate to them properly about how I was feeling and eventually they came to accept it and support me and I'm very lucky because I know that that's not the case for a lot of families and my father is such an incredible man uh, he lets love and family win over religion uh, and most of the time not in the case of some of my non-Jewish partners <laughs> but um, you know he played today at the Reason Rally um, the president of an, of an Orthodox synagogue playing at an at a atheist secular rally, so I'm very proud of him and uh, I, I hope that more people can, can be like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I like to say that he loves me more than he loves God. Why, why is that? What do you mean? Because he chose the relationship with me over what he'd been taught and I was quite aggressive about it. I remember when I was home one time I was, you know, I would open the Tanakh and I would read from it to my parents to kind of show them what they were missing because even though I'd studied it for years and years you read it with these blinkers on you have these these role models that you look up to like Abraham who's prepared to kill his son you know and, and then you read it for the first time and you think this is awful so I was trying to show it to them and I was reading it to them and I was walking around the house and there's this one passage that says if your child tries to take you away from God that you should kill your child and that you can't let anyone else kill them, you have to kill them. So I was walking around the house reading <laughs> to my father, Daddy, this is the God, this is Elohim, you must kill your daughter. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he got really angry, and, but, but he was able to take it and he was able to you know, talk it through with me, which is really nice. What is your favorite song that you've written? Because you write your own songs. Yes, um, it's really hard. I think Eve was one of my favorites to play. As we were talking about before, that focuses on the way that the Abrahamic traditions talk about women and women's roles and define them. And I don't want to be defined. I'm st as I'm starting to question my gender and explore myself, I see the ways that I've defined myself uh, without any choice. And I want to know who I am without the label of woman. And so. Um, yeah, I love I love singing Eve. It makes me feel very empowered. What do you think? Um, you know, why why is music such a tool for reaching people? What is, what does it touch? I think it's like all art. It shows us something of ourselves, and it gives us a context. It gives us a way of of seeing someone else, but also seeing ourselves. And I think it's very stirring. The music that always has touched me the most is that it's an honest story. So much, it's so specific that that couldn't have happened to me, but I, I relate to the genuine emotion behind that story. That's what moves me. I know different parts of it connect with other people, the rhythm and the chords, the melody and everything, but for me, it's the storytelling. I mean, uh, you know, um, the, the whole thing of um, Islamists, for example, banning music in Mali, for example. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it does sort of, it's like killing people, isn't it, in one way? To take away that form of expression that, I mean, when I'm in the lowest place that I can be, I pick up my guitar and I write a song and I let it out and I feel human and I feel productive and I feel like this is a way to grieve, to grow, to express joy. I grew up... I learned to sing in my father's wedding band and we play at bar mitzvahs and weddings and anniversaries and that's how people celebrate. That's how they, they share the moments that are important to them in their lives together with music, with song, with dance and if you take that away, that's taking away culture, that's taking away expression, that, yeah that would be a death and, uh, and 
you can see why they would do it because it's it's a form of control. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have so much respect and admiration for you, and and you inspire me very much. Oh, and you're an inspiration for so many people as well. My goodness. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We hope you enjoyed the interview with Shelley Seagal. I mean, she has so many really thoughtful things to say. I mean, I think she's so wise beyond all our ages. You know, it's, it's a fantastic listening to her. I could listen to her forever, uh, both her singing voice, but also um, what she has to say. And for me, I think the thing that really got at my heartstrings was the fact that you know, when she said that um, my father loves me more than he loves God and how important that is for so many people. You, you heard about the uh, woman who was recently burned alive by her mother and her family because she married someone that they didn't approve of. And when you think that, you know, you have a world with people like that and, you know, what a wonderful world this would be if people chose their children, humanity, before God. And I think a story when... Um, everybody's story, they, when, when you actually listen to a uh, story, when human beings become the center of the discussion mm -hmm. and debate, uh, and, and people express that, and how we have a lot to contribute to the world. I think that's so precious, and Shadi Sigan captures that beautifully. Yeah, well, we, we will uh, show some of her music at the end of our program, of her singing, so uh, you will get to hear that beautiful voice. The insane fatwa of this week is from who else but ISIS and it's linked to the uh, month of Ramadan. They've issued a fatwa which says that if you're not a member of ISIS and you don't like them, your fasting is not accepted. Your fasting is haram, it's not accepted. You've got to love us. Go straight to hell. You've got to love ISIS, otherwise, no matter how much. <laughs> they that must be desperate. Like, that, they're they so must, desperate. They must they're be so desperate. desperate. Because whatever they've done, it hasn't worked, and they're like, you know, you you believe in fasting. You're you gonna have love to be me. Our member first. No, you're gonna you love, love me. me. You got. I'm, I want to be loved. Me. You know. <laughs> I want to be loved. Off you go. <laughs> I want to be loved. Yeah. So I mean, talk about insane of insane of insane, and they've added some other ridiculous things, which is that um, women cannot leave the house until the evening, and unless accompanied by a, a male guardian, and no one is supposed to use hair gel in their hair during the month of Ramadan. But that must be all the time. Yes, I think that's what it that's is. That's all the time. But well, I think the, the, the bit that is very funny is just, you gotta love, love me. You gotta go on. You gotta love me. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise your fasting is not accepted. <laughs> hey, I don't think anybody loves them. <laughs> Our slice of life this week is from Khadija Abdul Muti. Beautiful. Uh, she uh, is seen in a short video cheering the kicking out of ISIS forces from her town. And she's wearing red. And because obviously uh, you can't wear red under ISIS held territory. Any colorful and dress you under you the Islamists uh, is not allowed anything, anything else. Yeah. And so she's saying that she's going to be wearing red every day, and that's why I'm wearing a red T-shirt in solidarity with uh, wearing red. Absolutely, and that <laughs> just that's a good trick, Maria. <laughs> a very good trick. But uh, um, you know, you know, the word without Islamists is a colourful and beautiful. Oh, word. so colourful, so colourful. It reminds me of that photograph of a woman who enters Kurdish liberated areas, and she's removing the black, uh, you know. Um, and under her burst colors. of colors, it's like, you know, so beautiful to see. Yeah. We should show that one more time because that's like one of those inspiring photos. Anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We uh, hope uh, you've enjoyed uh, this week's program. Don't forget to join us in defying fasting rules on the 24th of June by either joining us on social media or coming in front of embassies in London. And join the protest to, uh, in, in solidarity with Rauf Badavi. Thank you. And we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Bye until then.
Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.